moment and bow our heads. Let's just ask the Lord to, to come and teach us that he would do what he can do alone. Father, we thank you for this privilege of meeting with you over your word. Lord, your word is truth. Sanctify us in your truth. Sanctify us, O oh Lord, that we might understand the things that have been freely given to us by God. Lord, that we might not hold back. Lord, I ask for a heart of humility, Lord God, to receive the things that you will give us. That this implanted word will save not only our souls, Lord, but will cause us to do well. So we thank you for this. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've been working for the last three weeks now with this series called Bring It On. And I took that from um, a passage in Isaiah chapter 50, where it's talking about Jesus quite specifically, but it is also applicable to the work of his servant. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord is someone who he teaches with his counsel. He awakens their ear with a word in the morning, a, a word to sustain them and a weary person in their lives. But verse 7 says, because the Lord helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Many of us are going through things right now where the road which seems so hard up ahead, the things that seem so difficult up ahead makes us want to just say, can this be done? Can I just go some, can I not be part of that? You know, can I do an opt out? And as many of us know, life does not happen on our terms. It does not come in the way that we want it to happen. So the disciple of Jesus has a decision to make. Do I sit there and bawl my eyes out that life is just so hard because I did not ask for this? And in many cases, I did not deserve this because some of it was done to you unjustly. For some of us, the things we did are direct results of the things that we have done. But how do I respond in the midst of this? Do I just sit there saying, I guess that's my life? Or do I respond to God with a heart that says, Lord, I need you in the midst of this? And then this answer from Isaiah 57, which is, I've set my face like flint. And in modern language, it would be, bring it on. I'm ready to face it. I've set my face directly against what life seems to be saying, no, turn the other way, go the other way, detour, 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 move the other, move the other side. And you're saying, uh-uh, I'm not budging. God has something for me there. And just because my life looks difficult right now, I am not going to back up and I'm not going to back away. I'm going to say, bring it on. But part of that bring it on stance is you saying, Lord, I bring myself to you. I'm standing against the work of the enemy in my life. I'm standing against this sense of hopelessness, but I'm giving myself fully to the work of Jesus. So this week, I want to work with some of that. The first week of this series, we covered that you are kept in the love and care of God entirely. There is not a single thing that you are facing in your life that is outside of the love and care of God. Because when you face hard stuff, the immediate response to those things is, if God really loved me, would this happen to me? Now that is a faulty way of thinking from the get-go, because if you think about the relationships you have, when something doesn't, like, I, I gave you a very simple example. I like my, my wife's like meatloaf or something, and then she decides to make chicken. I'm going to be like, you don't love me because you made chicken today. Will I say that? No, that's ludicrous. Like, why would you judge not getting something you wanted? I'm using something very trivial. Something you did not get because you wanted it and something else was given. And you're like, well, that shows you don't love me. Excuse me? I'm still the one providing for you. I'm still the one loving you with the things I give to you. So when we see life and its hardship or its sidestepping of this was my plan A, 
Now I seem to be on plan Z. <laughs> I always feel like, oh, well, you didn't love me. That's why. And God says, no, that is a faulty assessment because I have never taken my love away from you. And how did he show us his love? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So you should always bring yourself back to that anchor point. Because when situations upset you, when situations destabilize you, the first thing the enemy of God goes for, he says, I want to get you to mistrust God. So when you get to a place like, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. And you're like, wait, did he answer me? He didn't answer me the way I thought he should answer me. He should have answered me yesterday. That's when I had the problem. Ah, you go back to Genesis. That was the first place Satan came to tempt Adam and Eve. Did God say? That was, he just left the question out there. He did not even try and convince them, don't go ahead, this fruit is really good. Did he say any of that? No. He was like, did God say? Try to bring into question whether what God was saying about who he was to you was actually true. So when you get to, I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered me. In the moment it feels hard. But I want to address this quite, I love that Bree touched on it. But I want you to understand this from Scripture. Why can you seek the Lord and He will answer you? Not He may answer you. He will answer you. It's because when we were in relationship with God in the garden, the enemy came to say, I will strip away that fellowship they have with God because I can undermine what God has planted in this relationship. That has been his goal the whole time. Lucifer said, I will ascend and make myself like the Most High God. I will be like God. And guess what happens? So this predates the creation of Adam, Eve, all of these things. This happened in heaven. And God says, because of your pride, he was struck down. I'm giving you a bit of backstory so you understand what's going on. Satan was struck down. He took a third of all of the heaven's angels with him. And there was a big rebellion in heaven. Why? Because I want to be like God. And he did not let me. Because he thinks that he's the only one who receives the glory. Suddenly there was this power play. At, but the devil was no match. So again, for anyone who's ever wondering. Satan is not God's opposite. He's not the anti-God. He's a created being made by God. So his assaults on the things of God are mere. All it takes is God saying, go. And he fell like lightning. He thought he could take God on, the one who created him. And then what does God go turn around and do? Into the place where he had abandoned and cast down. He says, I will get glory even in these places. And he forms man out of the dust. And he says, I will put my glory in them. And all of the angels are like, what? You're putting your, your very essence and your glory in dirt? Why would you do that? And he, gave, he made us in his image. He imbued us with his spirit and we became a living being. Get, and this was like, what, what, what? And Satan's going, wait, that was my gig. I, I wanted that. So what was his goal right from the get-go is, I, if I cannot have it, they can definitely not have it. So ever since then, he has been trying to erode this whole idea that you, are, you definitely do not have what God has for you. Because I couldn't get it, I'm going to take as many down with me as I can. So right from the garden, you have this imbalance at work. And Adam and Eve gave in to that. They sold their birthright with God for a mere fruit. Why? Because God said And the first thing that was assaulted is 
did God say? So when you are dealing with conflict, you're saying, I, I sought the Lord and He didn't answer. God says, every single time your sin puts you at odds with me, and that's what the enemy thought, yes, I've won it. Because there is no cry that these people will have that will ever allow a holy God to come and say, I will be with you. They can cry all they want. They can yell all they want. God will never hear them. Why? Because their sin has no fellowship with Him. Read 1 John chapter 1. You will understand that. You suddenly are left in this dilemma. How will humanity ever reach God? And Jesus says, Father, I will go. And He comes on the stage of human history and He says, I will take their place. Because the penalty for sin is death. So dying, they started to die all of from right from Adam, every generation. No hope. And there were temporary fixes with the life of an animal. But it would never blot out the sin that separated them from God entirely. It was a temporary fix. And God says the machine that makes sin and that froths within the human organism that starts to just like right from birth. There is no one who is born innocent. We are all under the specter of this curse which just says there is no communion with God. And in that place Jesus takes our sin and he says, Father, I will take their place. And guess what? And this is why I was, I was tearing up while we were singing those words. I sought the Lord and He heard and He answered me. Why? Because when Jesus was on that cross, He said, My Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? He took the forsaking that you were owed. That all the yelling you did, all the pleading you did, was not going to make any difference. Why? Because you were sinful. Because we all are sinful. There's not a single one of us that can escape that. And Jesus says, Father, I will take it. But he had to take it completely. And guess what? The Father could not have communion in that moment. And he says, I will cast their forsaking. On this one. And Jesus then takes the punishment of that forsaking. So that every single time for anyone who believes in not only the dead Jesus, but the resurrected one, which is the amazing part of the story. He did not stay dead. He rose up on the third day to new life. And he became someone who was a life-giving spirit. That anyone who believes in Jesus now have been transferred from death into life. Amen. I'm giving you the whistle stop tour right from Genesis all the way through. But when you get to the battles of life, guess what Rev Revelation 12 says? They overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb because He covered entirely your sin and everything that cast you aside and the testimony that is the Word. They said, I believe what God has said. That's how they overcame the enemy. That's the end of the story, folks. So when you are standing there, there is nothing in your past, your present, your future that can ever get in the way of God hearing your voice. Even when you feel like you don't have the words to pray. Even when you feel like, I don't know what to say. I hear that. Isn't that amazing? And we are sitting here saying, I don't know if God really even thinks about me. He did it on the cross. He did not leave even one little bit of this undone. He paid it in full. You will never have to be forsaken. You will never have to deal with the separation ever again. Why? This is what Jesus has done. So when you are loved and cared for, I know I took too long on that, but I need you to understand this. 
the love and care of God is irrevocable on your life. It cannot be pulled away from you. It, no matter what your circumstances, it cannot be taken away from you. You have an enemy who would love to say, did God really say he would take care of you? It doesn't look like it. And God's like, no, 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 no. What I need you, my son, my daughter, to stand up in is saying, I'm covered over with what Jesus has given me. So the position I have in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So all that forsaking is dealt with. So that I might now be called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. How do you and I ever have the audacity to stand up in the midst of trial and say, I am righteous and God will hear my, my cry? Because of Jesus. Do you understand why this is so central? If you're not established in this, the next step becomes all wonky. Because you're then trying to plead for a benevolent superpower to somehow affect your situation where you have no standing. Do you have standing in court? I do. I have standing. Why? Because it's the righteousness of Jesus. So I have a complete... I, when I present these papers in court saying, this is illegal, what is happening to me is illegal, you're not sitting there saying, you know, I was a bad kid when I was 15, and you know, I, I mean... You win some, lose some. I mean, I'm only human. You're not only human. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. I know that sounds all too much to contain. It is. This is why the free gift of God's grace is not a trivial thing. So you, sitting in this room, have a choice to make. Do I stand in the work of Jesus? And Jesus' work alone. Not my ability to fight my battles. Not my ability to be the smartest kid on the block. Or the best theologian who has done the best Bible studies. I am just me. And I am going to present God a heart of humility. Saying, Lord, here I am. I don't have anything. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't even begin to act like I know everything. I, I don't have anything. Accept what you have given me. Show me. Teach me. That leads us to the second C. So you are kept in the love and care of God, but you also now have access to the counsel of God. Lord, help me understand what's going on. Because now my heart is in a place of saying, I'm not going to be the smart guy. I'm not going to be the wise guy. I'm going to come to you for help. Teach me your ways. And the counsel of God is seen in the work of the cross, by the watering of the word, through the power of his Holy Spirit. It's all working together. He never leaves out the work of the cross being formed in you. I want to show you how saved you are. I want to show you how protected you are. I want to show you how different you are from that old person. So stop thinking like that person who's trying to make it work and trying to find a way for my life to just be a little bit better. Which is why I fundamentally have a problem when we have believers in the church of Jesus saying, I'm trying to be a better man. I'm, tr I'm just trying to be a, a, go a good Christian. Those things don't work. Because it was never about you being a better man. It was never about you being a better Christian woman. It was not about you being anything. It was about you saying, Lord, here I am. You have done the work. Show me how to walk it. Show me how to walk it. So when we come to this week, I want you to start taking steps against some of the things in your life. Because now we're working with discernment issues. Is this a place, which is a hard season I'm going through, where God wants me to surrender to Him? It's hard. I've never done this before in my life. And God's calling me to practice reading His Word. I don't do reading. Guess what? It's going to be a very hard road. Because God will bring you back to places where He says, you're going to have to read. I don't know what the Lord is saying. Well, read. I don't do that. It's hard. But that is the Lord's 
discipline. It's not the enemy trying to convince you that you shouldn't read. Do you, do you get me? Galatians 5, 22 and 23 talks about the, the gifts, um, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Does anyone know it in the room? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. So if those are the fruit of the Spirit, this is what the work of God's Spirit is like. If these things are not being trained in you, cultivated, what happens to fruit? Do fruit just happen? They are grown, right? It's not just there. It's grown. So what, what does that mean for you and me? I got to grow. I have to grow in these things. I have to grow in love. I have to grow in joy. Guess what? Not everything is happy stuff. This is where I practice joy. This is where I sow seeds of who my God is. I trust in God, my Savior, the one. You thought that was just a song? No, no, no. This is me planting seeds of trust so that joy is not a fake thing. Oh, yeah, my, my life is great. No, my life is not great, but I trust in God. So I can take joy, not in a phony sense, not in a fake sense, but in a very real sense. I trust him and that he has proven himself before he will do it again. You suddenly find working in the things of God becomes a surrendering issue. To grow in faithfulness. Some of us are not good at being faithful in things. It will be hard to learn faithfulness. Why? Because Jesus is faithful. Well, I mean, we as parents, Hannah and I, when we are sometimes talking to our kids about things that we want to see them grow in, and we're like, yeah, and your parents need to grow in that too. Because you suddenly discover the example that you were setting in some of the things you want to see in your children are things that you yourself need to mature in. Patience. How many parents here are pros in patience? You need, do you understand? But if you don't call it, who's going to call you on it? Do you think that's the enemy trying to get your kids to act up so you have a bad day? No, you just need to learn patience. We were talking about this in life group. It's amazing how when we come to God and ask, he says, I will give. But the question is, do we ask? Do we ask? Or we just think it's a bad situation. I just had a bad day. Chalk it off. Bad day. Take the next one. Oh, bad day. I'm having a bad season. Oh, chalk that one off. Oh, I had a bad couple of years. Guess what? Like that, you will always be looking behind your shoulder saying life was bad because bad is bad. And there was no growing happening. On the other end of this spectrum are things which are coming against you and you're calling in God, saying, did God really say? Threatening the voice of God in your life. And you have to choose, is this just me having a bad day? Or do I have to stand up and say, no, God said. It is written. A man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Because God was looking for a heart that says, here I am, Lord, teach me. I want to quickly work through Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. It's important that you see this. In chapter 6, verse 10, it starts off with what we call the armor of God. How many of you are familiar with this passage? Okay. If you're not familiar with this passage, this is where Paul is talking about how to deal with things that that you're involved in. Excuse me. How do you confront the things that you are facing in life? And he starts off this part of the passage by saying, finally, I want you to be strong in the Lord. He's talked to them about their identity in Christ. He's talked to them about what Jesus has done on the cross for them, establishing them in the things of God and the gift of the Holy Spirit who is going to be the fuel of what God does in his church. 
Okay? So that's chapters 1 through 5. So in summary, so this isn't the start. This is the summary, which is why we're dealing with this in this week. Finally, knowing that you're cared for and loved, your identity is in Christ. You have the Holy Spirit who is the counsel of God. The Word of God will teach you. Finally then, be strong in the Lord and in the power of, can you say this with me? His might. Whose might? His. His might, not my might. Finally, be strong in the Lord, which is a command. So immediately you say, oh, I've got to be strong in the Lord. Strong in the what? In the Lord. And in the power of who? His might. So it's not a strength feeling. It's not a, this is where I kind of start talking to myself, psyching myself up in the mirror. No, this isn't one of those things. This is me taking a posture of humility of saying, Lord, you're going to fight the battle. You're the one who goes ahead of me. So teach me to be strong in that. Establish my feet in that. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, just so you see this, where he's getting this, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might from. In verse 19 of chapter 1 of the same book, he says, I want you to know the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might. May the eyes of your heart be enlightened to see that. May God show it, reveal it to your heart, that you might understand that we're not dealing with something that's, oh, I guess I'll hear you and I'll try and do something about it. It's the power of God which controls and holds all things in this universe. He says, I've given you my spirit. What you are going to have to do is yield to the working of my power in your life. In chapter 3, so I'm, I'm dialing back in the same book. In chapter 3, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think or according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church Throughout generations. This is the working of Jesus' power. What you're working with over here. When we talk about the armor of God. Is nothing about you being a warrior. I know in Sunday school it makes sense to do all of that. Because it helps. It's a good teaching tool. Paul is trying to use this as a teaching tool to say. It's not about you getting strong. It's about what you're putting on. It's about you putting on Christ. It's not something you go to the army surplus store and go get some equipment. How many times do you read this passage and think you're supposed to go get something? It's like it's some piece of armor somewhere. It's not a piece of armor. It's the work of Jesus. And that's what I want you to see. It's the working of His power. Verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to do what? Stand. Can you say the word with me? Stand. That is my job. I'm not called to do any fancy footwork. I'm not called to do any big shows of strength. I'm going to go take the territory for the Lord. and I'll... Chill. He's asked you to do what? Stand against the schemes of the devil. You have to remember his scheme. He's been running the same plays. Think in football terms. He's been running the same dang plays since Genesis chapter 2. He's been trying to do this thing on human beings all the time. And it's the same thing. Did God say? You, you sure? Just get you to do a little bit of this and then he's got you off your game. Because if I can get you to question whether what you have is actually what you got. Fair game. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You once walked according to the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. You followed the passions of your flesh. So remember, this is a scheme of the devil. What do you desire? What do you want? Tell me what you want. Suddenly, what I want becomes the most important thing. Look at our society today. What does our culture thrive on? 
What does our culture thrive on? You, you want it? You, you, do you want it? Go, go, go get it. Go get it. You want it? Go get it. Not even once asking, is this something I should want? Why do I want these things? Psalm 23 addresses that. If the Lord is my shepherd, I have no want for anything. The problem is my wanter needs a lot of things now. I'm convinced I have a want. I'm convinced I have a deep need. Oh, I need that. Really, you need that. The closer, for those of us in this room who have had dear close ones pass away or go, go to be with the Lord, you suddenly discover how all of your life is a point. Like all the pursuits we call pursuits are pointless pursuits because you don't take anything with you. Nothing. Not even your kids, not even your wife, nor your dog. And these are precious things. The last list I mentioned was these are precious things. These are the people that matter. People. But you can't even take them. That's the heartbreaking part. But imagine how much we store our treasures in these things and pursuing these things and we forget that we've been called out by God to something that is greater. So that's the playbook. You need to know that's the playbook. And he's going to use it. If I can get you to want stuff, I can get you to mistrust God because you didn't get it fast enough. Jesus, when he was addressing People, we did this last year. In John chapter 8, he says, You are of your father the devil. Your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is the liar and the father of lies. He'll fill, he will feed you a whole steaming pile. And you will eat it. Why? Because it sounds good. And it starts with, did God really say that? I mean, why can't you have that? Or why can't you be offended about that? They did that to you. You owe it to yourself. Follow your heart. Oh, really? Your heart is deceitful above all things. If you are not operating in the new man which was created in Christ Jesus, I'm telling you, you will chase after things and you will not know what is front and what is back. He's been doing this for millennia. So how many years have you been on the planet? So he's been running the playbook for a while. So just before you think you're smarter than him and to get around him and how I got my desires in check. Hmm. Okay. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 says, No wonder even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. And this is one of the things that you have to be very, very careful of. The schemes of the enemy come as good things, not bad stuff. I mean, if it was doing the most horrendous things, some of, some of us have been involved in horrendous things, and God has saved us from those things. Great. But guess what? Now that you are saved... You tend to have this kind of, I'm good. Just got a touch of gossip and jealousy in my heart. No big deal. I'm actually concerned for that brother there. Oh, really? Well, you just thought that that would just skate on by. He says, don't you care about that person? It sounds like a very nice thing. And there you go, the whole time, forgetting that you were called for a different purpose. These are things that I'm working through right now. Lord, show me the places that I think are light, but are actually darkness. 
expose the things in my life that I think are actually light, which are darkness. Because I'm blind to some of these things and I need your spirit to show me. In verse 12 of chapter 6, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You need to establish this fact. You are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against cosmic powers over this present darkness. Against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. How many of you have got your military training to deal with spiritual forces? The problem is we try and fight life situations on this plane. And we think, oh, it's a job problem. Oh, my wife, she's the problem. You forget you're dealing with something that is far deeper. If he can pull you away from your communion with God, he can steal your birthright. He can steal the benefits of what God has given you. Does it make you any less saved? No. But you will not taste the goodness of what you've been called to. If you do not abide in the vine, you will not bear fruit. Jesus is talking about communion all the time. Every place you see Jesus talk about what he has done for you, it's so that you would be reconciled to God, his Father. So that you would have closeness to God. Not farness, not I'm pleading from afar, hoping you will hear me kind of relationship but a close relationship. And what does the enemy of your soul want you to feel like? Close? You're not even the same zip code as God. God doesn't even know you. God's busy. He's got a billion other people to deal with right now. I mean, how how many of you have heard that phrase about something like, for instance, you've got a small cold. How many of you pray about your cold? Most of us don't. Why? Why? I don't want to bother God with the small stuff. Oh, really? Do you see the kind of relationship? It looks like light. It's darkness. It gets you to start practicing a way that says, I do not have to go talk to God about this. This is pointless. It's just an attitude. Just having a bad day. Ah. There is a surrender part for sure, but there is a stand up against, which I am not doing, and I'm just letting life happen to me. Because I think it's just all going to happen. I mean, it happens to them, it happens to me, it happens to me. But I do not live and walk through life the same way everyone else does. You have to reckon that. And that song we sang, Ephesians, it comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 to 23. When Christ was raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is to be named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. He put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. He is the champion not because he won a skirmish somewhere. He's the one who came and dealt with it once for all. And when he says, I am above every name and principality and everything that comes and fights against you. I am over all of that and I have been given to you as the church. And what do we do? I don't know who's there to protect us. I mean, Israel and, you know, and what's happening in Russia and, uh, oh, America is going down the tubes. And uh, I don't know if God even. Okay, Mr. Busy Yaffer. You acting like as if you do not have a God who is over any of these things. Do you understand how busy we are with our mouth? We talk a big game Of what? Our hopelessness and how we don't see a solution and how this is. Stop talking for a second and remember who you belong to. If Jesus, who is above all dominion and power, is still where he is seated. 
I position myself and saying, Lord, in the midst of this mess, what would you have me do? I'm an agent at your command. What would you have me do? But do we ask? And that is the thing I'm trying to draw you to is saying this time period that we are living in right now is way too important for us to talk about what our eschatology is. Do you believe this is the end time? Do you believe this is the beast? Do you believe that? I don't, I can, we can have discussions for all those things as much as you want. The issue is, are you someone who God can get to and vote on or please be someone who's just humble to the Lord to respond to him in everything that you do. You will start to find wisdom will happen not because you tried. Wisdom will happen because you belong to him. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 9 through 11 says, And God wants to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God. He created all things so that in the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Who is he making a display for? Not for, not for your boss, not for your wife to know that you were right the last time. And she, he's always right. But it, was, it is not for those things, those petty things that you get oh, oh, so uptight and all busy about. He's like, I'm making a display through the church for the principalities and powers that are watching. That through this piece of dirt, my glory will be revealed. I will strip you of your power through dirt. Mere human beings are now suddenly in the position to stand in the victory of Jesus and say, this will not pass. And suddenly this... 500 pound, like imagine, you know, like imagine someone like a five-year-old standing in front of a 500 pound lineman kind of thing. Going to get crushed the moment that guy moves. He, he doesn't have to move. He just needs to fall. Right? But in the midst of that kind of a battle, suddenly you're able to stand up and say, no, this will not pass. Because God has said. And suddenly your weapon becomes what God has said. So now when you put on the whole armor of God, verse 13, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Do you see this whole idea of I will, my bring it on stance is not so that I become the big show. My bring it on stance is I've set my face directly towards the things of God, and I will not cede the territory. I will not let this territory go. So what is the things that he has given us in verse 14? Stand, therefore, having the belt of truth and having the breastplate of righteousness. The truth of who God is and what Jesus has done and the righteousness of God is the position you stand in. That's what holds everything together. That's what gives you the safety you need against what comes against you. Are you protected by the work of God's righteousness in you? Or are you constantly accusing yourself that you're not worthy of His love? Or worthy to stand in the day of trouble? Do you see why truth and righteousness are very fundamental? Because if you don't think you have what it takes, you will not stand. You will bail. The moment you see trouble come, you will bail. You'll be like, I, this is way above my pay grade. You're standing in the power of Jesus' might. Verse 15. And as for shoes for your feet, having the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Many times I've heard people talk about this like it's the preaching of the gospel. It isn't. It is you have your feet firmly planted in what the peace of God has done. What is the gospel of peace? That you who are far off have been brought near. You have a position to stand in. That is why it's in the shoes. It's not about running. It's not a running kind of a thing. Everyone's used that analogy about running with the gospel and going to places. It has to do with standing. 
Notice, read the context of the passage. It's not talking about you going anywhere. It's talking about you standing. So what does the standing with the gospel of peace have to do? Jesus has finished the war. I'm standing on that victory. I am not going to start trying to do fancy footwork. No, I'm standing in the gospel of peace. He himself is our peace who made us both one. He's broken the dividing wall of his hostility. We have access to the Father through this peace. This is why peace is a gospel to you. You have access to God. You have access to God through what Jesus has done. Verse 16. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. You are shielded by our responding to what God says. Can I break that down? Faith in those terms for you. What is faith? Responding to what God says and how he says it. When God says, I will provide, you will provide. I say, and I respond to what you have said. That is faith. Faith approaches God with a simplicity, not with a bravado, simplicity. So when you're tackling difficult situations in your life, you're standing in what Jesus has done. And I respond with faith. And guess what you're protected by? The helmet of salvation. Entirely covered over by the work of Jesus. I am not doing this by myself. I would get crushed the moment I try and take on any situation. But I can stand up to principalities and powers, rulers in heavenly places. People, I'm saying we have no shot if we try and take this on. But in the work of Christ, we can. So this is why it is so important that we do this. Verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all supplication, to that end, keep up all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. You have the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? God's Word. So God's word, then used in your mouth in verse 18, right? You're able to pray the word of God, praying in the spirit at all times with all kinds of prayers. Not prayers that you cooked up. The Holy Spirit will give you utterance. You will suddenly find Holy Spirit becoming your teacher to show you things that you don't know. For some of you, this might be very new. But guess what? The more you yield to this process of saying, Lord, I'm going to surrender so that I can stand. I'm going to surrender so that I can stand. I'm not going to keep trying to get my logic working to say, this is what I need to do first and then next. And then if I understand this theology, then I'll understand that theology. I'm going to surrender. When I surrender to the work of his spirit and the work of his word, I'm able to stand. I want to just leave you with these things as we have communion. The work of the cross is so central. If no one has one of these, if, if anyone doesn't have one of these, please go grab one. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, you were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, and God made you alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses by canceling out the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. There was a case pending in heaven against you and me. It had legal demands. This he set aside by nailing it to a cross. So he basically took that edict where there was an open case where there was a penalty judgment issued. What was the penalty judgment? Death. If there was sin, the penalty of that is so he takes that, he puts it on the cross, and he says, death has been paid for this sin. He disarmed. By doing that, what did he do? He disarmed the rulers and authority and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Do you see that what Jesus did for you was not only dealing with what stood against you, then 
for all eternity. There's not a single principality or power that can come and say, well, I have something against this guy. Jesus says, no, it was nailed to the cross. You don't have an argument to make. So what is, we, we, we're hearing these phrases nowadays, right? Does the enemy have standing in court? Does he have standing? He cannot. He does not have standing. He cannot bring a case against you. Why? Because it's been paid for. And there is no new evidence that can come to light that says, now you have standing to bring it against this person. So when you and I share in communion, when we say, I have received what Jesus has done, there is no standing against me. I'm covered in the work of Jesus. Romans 8, verse 37 and 39 no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're going back full circle. If Jesus loves you, every single thing against you does not stand a chance. I want you to hear that again. If Jesus loves you, this is the most basic truth of Christianity. If Jesus loves you, there is nothing that comes against you that stands a chance. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to do what? Separate me from the love of Jesus Christ. So as you open this here, as you take this little wafer out, which represents his body being broken for you, you are saying, Lord, your body was broken so that I might receive wholeness in you. There are so many things about my life that don't look whole. But I receive the wholeness of God. Why? Because you said it. And you did what you said you would do by going to the cross for me. So I want to receive that today. If any of you are sitting here in this room saying, but my life is broken. I want you to receive this here today. And say, Lord, as I eat this, I want to receive what you have done for me. Lord, I ask that you would do the repairing work, the restoring work that my life needs. Can you do that with me? Similarly, when Jesus shed his blood on the cross, it was declaring, it was yelling into the cosmos. There is nothing against them anymore. Every single ruler, every single principality, every single thing that comes against you is now, have, now has to go through Jesus to get to you. And Jesus says, I've been there, I've gone through the grave, and I've come out victorious. There is nothing that they can bring against you that can come against you successfully. Because Jesus has conquered it. So as you receive this, you're saying, I'm more than a conqueror in Christ, not because my life looks great, but because Jesus has done something eternal. I know heaven is my home, not because that's where I want to be when I die and go off, leave. The right now, heaven is my home. I'm seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Right now, not tomorrow, right now. So when I receive this, I'm not receiving something that's like some Talisman that will suddenly fix all my situations. I'm receiving this as life to me because Jesus shed his blood for me and I now have no thing standing in the way. Not a single thing. All right, can we receive that together? Lord, we receive the work of the cross and all it declares over us. Lord, there is so much that you have done. So many wonderful things that we are yet to discover. I ask, O oh Lord, that you by your Holy Spirit would teach us and lead us into truth. Lord, as we go through the rest of this year and as we consider your word, I ask that you would establish us in these things. That we would learn to take ground from the enemy, not because of our strength, but because of the strength of your might. Because of the working of what Jesus did on the cross. Lord, that we would understand these things in the heart of hearts. Lord, that these things would not be mere theology to us, but it would be life. Thank you in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. As we close, um, I just got a couple.